well, is your life awesome? Or is life in general really awesome? Is life awesome? I bought a book in 2011 uh, called The Book of Awesome, and it lists over 100 awesome things and then goes on to explain them. And it's a hilarious read. I would recommend it to you. It lists things that are awesome, like your own pillow. Your own pillow, not a pillow at a hotel, not a friend's pillow, your own pillow. Think about how awesome your pillow is. It's like it belongs to you. Or maybe building a fort as a kid with sheets and blankets. How awesome is that? You remember that? Snow days, awesome. Finding extra fries at the bottom of a bag, awesome. Things like that, this book would go on and on, intended to remind you of how awesome life really is. Now, several years ago, there was a movie that came out called The Lego Movie. And all these little animated Legos sing about how everything is awesome. These little Lego figures say everything is awesome. Everything is cool when you're part of a team. Everything is awesome when you're living out a dream. Blue skies, bouncy things. We just named two awesome things. A Nobel Prize, a piece of string. You know what's awesome? Everything. Dogs with fleas, allergies, a book of Greek antiquities, brand new pants, a very old vest. Awesome items are the best. Trees, frogs, clogs, they're awesome. Rocks, clocks, socks, they're awesome. Figs and jigs and twigs, that's awesome. Everything you see or think or say is awesome. Everything is awesome. Now, for those of you who had kids about 11 years ago or 10 years ago, you, you just were triggered by that song being sung repeatedly in your house. Everything is awesome when you're part of a team. And is your life awesome, as the philosophers of Legos say? Is your life awesome according to things like having a pillow? St. Augustine, in the book City of God, written about 1,600 years ago, actually argued against life being awesome. He said very descriptively that life is not awesome. And in fact, in his very long book called The City of God, he argued for a full chapter listing things over and over again that make life not awesome. He says, who can describe, who can conceive the number and severity of the punishments which afflict the human race? Pains which are not only the accompaniment of the wickedness of godless men, but are a part of a human condition and common misery. What fear and what grief are caused by sorrow and mourning, by losses and judgment, by fraud and falsehood, by false suspicion, and all the crimes and wicked deeds of other men? For by wicked people we suffer robbery, captivity, chains, exile, torture, mutilation, loss of sight, the violation of chastity to satisfy the lust of the oppressor, and many other dreadful evils. What numberless casualties threaten our bodies from without? Deadly heat and deadly cold, storms, floods, blizzards, lightning, thunder, hail, earthquakes, houses falling, or from the stumbling or shine or vice of horses, now cars, from countless poisons of fruit or water or air or animals, What disasters are suffered by those who travel land or sea? What man can go out of his own house without being exposed to all kinds of unforeseen accidents? Returning home with a sound in limb, he slips on his own doorstep, breaks his own leg, and never recovers. What can seem safer than a man sitting in his own chair until he falls and breaks his neck? Augustine, 1,600 years ago, before Legos and the Book of Awesome, observed that life is not awesome. And now what Augustine does is not only observe our life as harsh and rough, but argues from Scripture, and that's really what his book is about, from Scripture, that this is what you and I should fully and regularly expect. We should expect life to not be awesome. Severity, cruelty, sin, both from ourselves and even from others. And our passage this morning is about God dealing with the sinners who have committed what is called cosmic treason against him. You remember last week where he he aims uh, a pronouncement of wrath against the devil who tripped man and woman up. But here he now speaks of the punishment that, that man will have and woman will have. You remember the woman from chapter 2 and 3, she sinned and will in our passage receive a judgment handed down by God. The man, you remember from chapter 2 and 3, he too sinned. 
and he'll receive the bulk of judgment language from God in the passage. But, but don't worry, <laughs> there is a little bit of hope at the end where in banishing his rebellious creatures from his presence in paradise, the Lord will still extend his grace and mercy to so many. So I want to talk about this in a couple of areas. You might have an outline provided for you in the bulletin. Chapter 3, verses 16 through 24, I'm going to take it in three separating categories where I think we can see ultimate truth come from these three things. The first one, he'll address with a judgment the woman. The second, a judgment toward man. And then third, he'll pronounce their banishment from the garden forever. But first, the woman receives a judgment we see in verse 16. Look there at the text. This is a part of this is part of the speech from God where he first spoke to the, speech, to the serpent, now he's speaking a second time to the woman. Look at verse 16. It says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband and he shall rule over you. God here judges the woman for her sin. And his judgment comes in two parts. We see this clearly just within that that one verse, two parts that he talks about the judgment that the woman will receive. Uh, that's, that's what, that was Eve's calling before the fall as being shown as being a helper and being fruitful. Uh, you should remember that the woman was first blessed with these two things. She was, she was called by God, made by God to be a helper to her husband, and then also she was called to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with little glory reflectors of image bearers. That was Eve's calling before the fall. And the, and the judgment that she receives is at these two things in a near reversal. First, there will be what's called a multiplication of pain and childbearing, and second, a proneness to antagonize her relationship with her husband. Now, notice the woman experiences the fallenness of the world within her primary sphere of responsibility. The, the man will receive this as well. What do we see in chapter 2 in the garden? This perfect scenario in the garden where she had two spheres of responsibility, not to the exclusion of, of everything else, but two, from her word, primary responsibilities. She was to be a helper to her husband, and together, with her husband, they were to be fruitful and multiply. She was to be a helper to her husband and then a mother in bearing four children. So it's no coincidence. This is just logical. It's no coincidence that, that those two primary spheres of responsibility are the ones that are singled out as being affected by the fall. On the, on the other side of sin, she now experiences pain in these two areas of responsibility. And I want to flesh this out a little bit, these two first things. The first one, obviously, I don't want to talk much about the childbearing part, but it is the expression of the judgment for the woman that childbearing will be painful. We can assume that childbearing, theoretically and practically, before the fall, would have not been painful. It would have been fully a joy. But here it's talked about as being painful. And it's, and it's obvious practically and textually that this doesn't isolate itself to the birthing process. So what I think is clear here in the text is not just the, just the bringing forth of life from the womb will be painful, but also the entire experience of raising children will be painful. And we can see this from the text, where if you just isolate some of these Hebrew words and then the flow of the text as it's talked about, and the whole experience of raising children will be a multiplication of pain. You'll see in the text that the repetitional phrase, which expands the, the meaning here, it says, in pain, you shall bring forth children. So having children, raising children, though a gift and certainly a blessing as it's intended to be, it will have his moments, its moments of glory. It is going to be painful, though, from start to finish. You see how those, those two phrases interact with each other. I'll multiply your pain in childbearing, and in pain, you shall bring forth children, not just babies, but children as they would grow. Now, having children as a blessing here is impacted by the fall. Or in other words, the Lord says that grief surrounding the responsibility that the woman has been given and the privileges of which she has been blessed with will now be multiplied with pain because of her sin. So that's part of the curse for Adam when the Lord curses the ground or the world, you could say, her, the effect on her will be pain and childbearing. Now, secondly, though, there's a second part to this, the second part of verse 16. Look at verse, look at verse 16 and the second part. This is a hotly debated sentence in some theological circles. Now, by the way, it's only been hotly debated in the last hundred years, but it says, your desire shall be, 
And here's how my translation, of what's called the, uh, the ESV translation, it says, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, it's helpful to understand what this practically means, but theologically and also in our own action, it's helpful to understand that the word for here, this preposition, this is the Hebrew word el, so just E-L, we could write it out in English, and some of you have the translation that has, instead of for, some of you might have a translation that says against, so it shall be against your husband, you, your desire shall be against your husband, or even opposite, mine, mine has one of those little footnotes by it, mine has a little number four that goes down to the bottom, using those cross-references, where this could be translated either for or against or opposite. Your desire will be opposite against your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, what is happening here? Part of what is challenging about this verse are also the words that are around it, so desire and rule. We can understand what what the for means if we also try to understand what desire and rule mean as well. To desire your husband could be a good thing. Like, like romance, you, you have a passion or desire for your husband. And rule is not always a bad thing. We, we very often see it as good in the Scriptures. We've, we've already seen from chapter 2 the sense in which man is given a certain kind of rule or reign within his marriage and creation. We, we see that as good. And here it, it seems like it switches. She's to help him, in Genesis 2, rule and reign the earth. So desire and rule are not necessarily bad on their own. But what seems to be in the view of verse 16, just understanding the the tense and the emotion of these words, what seems to be in view in verse 16 is a uh, usurping or a seizing kind of desire and then also a harsh or cruel dominating role, rule. That's why some translations, instead of having the preposition L, they have it or instead of for, they have it as contrary or against. And, and that's understood based on the way the same word is used later on in Genesis 4. So just one chapter later, there is an example of Scripture interpreting, or for us defining, what is truly intended here in Genesis 3, verse 16. If you've got a Bible, flip over to one page, chapter 4, and go to verse 7. Go to verse 7. The key, I think, to interpreting verse 16 is found in Genesis 4, verse 7. And this is, this is called allowing Scripture to interpret Scripture. Sometimes we, we find difficult passages or phrases, and we just naturally go, what does that mean? And in, and in other areas, in other categories of Scripture, they actually not only mean something on their own, but they can help inform us of what possibly this confusion to us might mean. So look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. It says, if you do well will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. We've got the same words there, and that could also be translated against or opposite. Sin's desire is for you, or sin's desire is against you or opposite. We would all rationally go, of course sin's desire is against me. What what does Satan want to do in tempting us to sin? To defame God in his glory, so sin, as it's crouching at the door, is for you. You would understand that to mean against you or opposite of you. The same kind of preposition is used there. But notice, it's not only using the same word, it's also almost the exact same Hebrew sentence. Its desire is for you, contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You can almost exchange some of the nouns or the context there. It's a totally different episode, but it's talking not only about the same thing, but it's also using the same language. Even in English, that's almost the same sentence as we have in chapter 3. So, so one can help interpret the other. Cain, the Lord is saying, sin is desiring to have mastery over you. It's crouching at your door. And in the same way, the woman, while experiencing the curse of the fall, desires to have mastery over her husband. But the husband, on this side of the fall, will have the desire to dominate her. And insofar as the husband, while experiencing the curse of the fall, his rule becomes what was once godly and kind. His rule becomes harsh, domineering, instead of, was what, instead of what it was meant to be, gentle, gracious, loving leadership. Now, hopefully, I can say this in simple form. An effect of the fall for the woman is that she will be prone to usurp the leadership of her husband. And the effect on him is 
on, on this side of Eden, Eden, you could say, will be to rule harshly instead of kindly and graciously. You can, you can already see the, the beginning of what is so sad in the world around us where we recognize it's not awesome. Why? Because of the effect of sin in life. Now, of course, we try to mitigate the effects of the fall, and we should. It is not bad to take something so that childbirth is less painful. That's not ungodly. It's not unbiblical. Nor is it wrong that the husband and wife should try to love each other well so that the effects of the fall are lessened. This is simply indicating the normal course of human affairs. Not that everyone gets married, not that everyone who is married is able to have children, but Genesis 3 is speaking to what they would have seen as the normal course of affairs. And and both of those spheres of responsibility are affected by the fall. Now, I, I, want, I think this is even more helpful to understand through the lens of, of what one of the apostles is teaching on this passage in particular. I, I would normally turn your attention to Ephesians 5, but I won't in the case of time. But there, in Ephesians 5, you can just write down the, the note and go to it later on. But there, in Ephesians 5, Paul is writing to a church and gives them teaching about living in holiness and walking in godliness. So here, Christians of Ephesus Grow in holiness, walk in holiness, walk in godliness. How? Well, in part, he speaks to the wives and then to the husbands directly in chapter 5. And his positive instruction actually comes from their Genesis 3 areas of proneness. So how can I be a godly husband? Paul, tell me through a letter. He'll take me back to the, to the root, if you will, in Genesis 3, their area of fallenness. What, what is the wife's sinful temptation as a result of the fall relative to her husband to usurp his authority. It's a want of usurpation of his God-given leadership over her. So what is the apostle's one imperative for the wife in that letter? Wives, he says, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, why do this? You might say, why? Because, he says, for or because the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And then in verse 24, like the church submits ourself to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. He also addresses the man here. So man is not off on this instruction. And what's man's temptation given to fallenness? Man's temptation and given to fallenness is to be a jerk, is to be harsh, is to be mean, or even worse, lazy. What was Adam doing in the garden when temptation was knocking at her door? He was advocating his responsibility to love her by being a lazy loser, letting a serpent talk to her. So what does Paul say? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and died for her. You can imagine and because this is Oklahoma, I actually dreamed about this last night. Not in this particular case. But what do all Oklahomans dream of? Tornadoes. You can imagine your wife going outside, as all of us do, right? Whenever there's a tornado around, like, I want to look at it. Everyone who's from Iowa is like, do you not have basements anywhere? No. Let's look at it. So you can imagine your wife going out to look at a tornado, even, even maybe walking towards it, as we are all tempted to do. How should her husband care for her? Wave say, you know, that's just, that's just what she wants to do? Or and how can he love her in such a way? We, we remember from a couple weeks ago, how could have Adam loved Eve at that moment? Was stand in between the serpent and the woman and say, talk to me. Talk to me. She's mine. You don't, you don't own her. She belongs to the Lord's. So talk to me like a man. All right, so husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Quickly, for you and for me, on this side of the garden, how should you and I live understanding the proneness here, of the woman having pain in childbearing and the temptation to usurp the authority of her husband. How do we live on this side of the garden? Well, cleanly and clearly, not according to our flesh, not according to the proneness of our heart, having inherited the sin and also sinning on ourselves, but according to Colossians 3, by putting off the old self, which is prone in this way with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of the Creator. We, we should seek obedience to God's Word, knowing that given who we are, we can be more like Him through faith and repentance. So judgment comes 
for the woman, but it also, secondly, comes for the man. We see the man receiving a judgment in verses 17 through 19. We see here now the third speech. The sentence of the pronouncement on the man is the longest of the three. Part of his sin is specifically and is listening to his wife instead of listening to the Lord's word. Look at verse 17. Now, obviously, it's not that listening to your wife is wrong. I would encourage you to do so. But here, listen, what he did was he listened to his wife, which led him into sin, also singled out at the beginning of verse 17 because it represents an abandonment of his God-given responsibility. Who is he supposed to be focused on most and first? The Lord. To be a leader and to be a protector of what God gave him, it would be like us in our case. His head would be in the book more than anything else. He obeyed Eve instead of God. Now, Francis Schaeffer comments on this passage saying, it's interesting that almost all of the results of God's judgment because of man's rebellious state in some way are to the external world. I'll say that again. It's, it's interesting that, this is Francis Schaeffer, it's interesting that almost all of the results of God's judgment because of man's rebellion relate in some way to the external world. They're, they're not just bound up in the mind of Adam or in Eve. The judgment is not just bound up in the mind of Adam and Eve. They're not just psychological problems. Profound changes make the external objective world abnormal. The judgment is not just on the mind, but it affects so much even beyond the man. And this is important for you and I to understand because if the effects of sin are solely in the mind, then we can imagine that sin, or at least the effects of sin, may be cured by our own thoughts to the point where we actually don't need something beyond us. We don't need God at all. I just have to straighten up. I just have to think better. Or I just have to know more to where my mind can now fix the problem that I have, but it it also extends itself even beyond us. It is clear even in this passage that what is needed to man is something beyond man can provide for himself. And this is important for us to understand. We need a deliverer even at the beginning. From ourselves and the curse of the fall, we need a redeemer. The effects of sin are not merely psychological, though sin does affect the mind and personality. They are also external in the very nature of things. So the cure must be found in the God who made these things and brought these specific aspects of his judgment on the world. Now, Adam's sin will have a just punishment on him. The judgment on Adam is in three parts. First, the ground is cursed because of Adam. Before it had produced fruit and every good plant in abundance, but now it will still produce what is good, but it will also produce thorns and thistles faster and abounding in their torture. And growing the food necessarily for the uh, survival of him will now become a chore. He previously had a tree of life that if he just ate from it, he'd have everything and he'd live forever. But now he lives in a world that has a cursed ground. Second, Adam is condemned to live by the sweat of his brow, before his work had been pleasure. And now, although the nature of work itself is still good, there's nothing wrong with work pre-fall, the activity of work will be accompanied by pain and weariness, so that Adam might say, as Job later did say, does not man have hard service on this earth? Are not his days like those of a hired man, like a slave longing for the evening shadows, or a hired man waiting eagerly for his wages. Work will become miserable for his life. And you and I understand, is life awesome? Yeah, if we didn't have to work for anything, right? Now third, there's a third part of, his, of the curse that he'll inherit. There is an end decreed here, an end that is not a release, but an end that shows itself as a disaster. It's death, it's disillusion of the man in totality. God speaks of it saying, you will return to the ground since from it you were taken. Remember, Adam was made of the dust. For dust you are and dust you will return. See that in verse 19. We acknowledge this sad end at every funeral service as a casket may go down into the ground. We, we say this from dust to dust, ashes to ashes, recognizing that, that man was made from this. And then punishment or in judgment, man will die. 
But notice, just as the woman's fallenness affected her primary sphere of responsibility in Genesis 2, the, the man's fallenness affects his primary sphere of responsibility as well, which is the ground. He was supposed to rule and reign over everything in front of him. And so God's judgment of human rebellion is a reversal in its entirety of the blessing of paradise. God's judgment of sin means banishment from the full presence of a holy God. It introduces pain and childbearing, strife for dominance in marriages, thorns and thistles in our fields and gardens, work that becomes painful, toil to wreak havoc on the living, to where at the end of our days we just die. So is everything awesome? Is life awesome? No. <laughs> life is tragic. It's a tragic story of paradise and the garden being lost because of man's sin. And it seems that we cannot get back to the peace and the harmony of paradise. Thirdly, I think you should understand just the, just the totality. We seem, to, we seem to talk about the woman a lot. And we seem to talk about the effect on the man a lot. And we often overskip or we skip over the, the banishment that then comes, or even we, we downplay it a little bit because we recognize that there are hundreds of chapters that come after Genesis 3, and we recognize, well, yeah, they were banished, but, but there's, a, there's a pathway of where it will get better. God here says that he will drive them out of the garden. That, that language there, he drives them out, he banishes them, but he doesn't do this without hope given to them. We see hints of hope in the sad narrative being given uh, toward the face of Satan with Eve looking on in Genesis 3.15, that, that from her offspring would be someone who would come and conquer the seed of the serpent. But we even have more hope than that within this text. We see a couple of hints of hope in this sad narrative. I want to give you three of them. In, in banishing his rebellious people, truly happened, from paradise, God will still extend his grace in order to restore paradise on earth. We see, we see hints of this even before this. What happens when Adam and Eve sinned? God came toward them, spoke toward them. He could have just knocked them out completely. Fire from heaven on them, justly applied. But here, another case where we see glimmers of hope, even in, in through their banishment. The, the first glimpse of, of hope is a glimpse of offspring. Okay, so he's not done with humans. In verse 20, look at verse 20, where it says... The man called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. In spite of pain and childbirth, God's blessing of procreation would remain. The birth pangs themselves are not only a reminder of the punishment that our sins deserve, but also a sign of God's grace, a reminder of God's grace being extended through his people. And in spite of the penalty of death, the generations of human beings will continue and prosper. Eve will become what is called in the text, the mother of the living. Now, Adam names the woman after hearing God's judgment against her. Adam names her kindly. Now, I've heard this said other ways. I hope it makes sense to you. I recognize that in a 40, 45-minute sermon, not all of you hear everything I say. Right? I get that. I understand that. You should. It's so good, all of it, right? But you might, you might walk away. You might even go in a car ride on the way home and say, hey, what'd you get out of the sermon? What'd you hear from the hear from the Word? Or, or how did that sermon deepen your under, understanding of what God is teaching us through His Word? It, it's like Adam heard this, this great sermon at the serpent, at Eve, and even at him, and he heard one thing and responded one way. He says, wow, that was a sermon. Her name is now Eve, the mother of the living, where God's blessing will continue through her, even though it would be painful, even though we will have strife. There is something bigger happening here. The name, Hawa, suggests the woman's unique role, since it sounds like the Hebrew word means of what it means to give life, Ha. The new name Adam gave his wife emphasizes the woman's life-giving role that counteracts the curse of the sin, which is death. The irony here, you will die, but you will keep on living through your offspring. So there's a glimpse of offspring. Secondly, there's a glimpse of acceptance. This is just a minor point, uh, though it is, I shouldn't have said it's a minor point. This is a huge point. All right, look at verse 21. It says, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin. And he clothed them. These are people who created havoc for you and I today. They sinned against a holy God. 
They were called to obey, and they rebelled, and then they hid. They hid in such a way that they tried to hide themselves. Friends, how many times do you and I, in our own sin, think it is best if I hide, or even if I try to cover myself up? But what does a seeking Savior do in this case? Draws them to himself and gives them robes. We see this fleshed out even more brilliantly and brazenly in the New Testament, where it talks about in our repentance and faith, it is like we, are, we have a dawning of clothes on us that are called the righteous robes of God. Friends, no need to hide. No need to make you know, clothes for yourself spiritually. But we are wrapped by a good God who equips them to face the hostile environment outside of the garden. A third and final glimpse for our time this morning. There's a glimpse of protection. In verse 23, there's a glimpse of protection. It says in verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, banished from the garden, banished from paradise, banished from the presence of God, which is the worst of all punishment. But why though? Why would God punish just after clothing his people? Why would God God banish them from the garden? Well, what was in the garden? The tree of life? The tree of knowledge of good and evil? Verse 22 answers that. And so it brings on a therefore from verse 23, because the punishment for sin must be allowed. Verse, Verse 22 in the first part, it says, The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reached out his, now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and will live forever. And then therefore the Lord God sent them out of the garden. Friends, to understand this, can you imagine what a disaster it would be for sinful human beings to live forever? Like the ancient murderer Lamak of the Old Testament, or even more modern murderers like Stalin or Hitler. Can you imagine them? being able to live forever. So in many ways, God in his grace puts evil outside of the garden, even though that it's inherited from human beings. No matter how great the reign of terror of evil people, we know that they will all die and they will not outlast the one who is truly good. So we drove them out. And it's, this is a phrase that's often used in the Pentateuch uh, of the expulsion of the inhabitants of Canaan. They would drive them out of Canaan. They would drive them out of Canaan. And, and with this escalation of terms, the narrator would have Israel feel the, opposite, the awful disaster of all that had taken place. Remember the context of Genesis. And every time, remember the context. Moses is writing this book inspired by God to a particular people so that they would have uh, a, an encouragement in their faith. They would have had alarm bells going on in their head about what it means to be driven out, what it means to be banished from something, what it would mean to be taken out of something. So alarm bells would have gone on when they hear about Adam and Eve being driven out of the garden just like they had been driven out of the garden from or from the promised land. And just like disobedient Israel would have been driven out of the promised land into exile, Adam and Eve forfeited their place in the garden. And sadly, it says there's no way back. In verse 24, at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way of the tree of life. Now, you might see this in cartoon form. You may have even tried to draw this in your own form. You may just look at this passage and go, what? Cherubim and flaming swords guarding the garden? The language of cherubim as... Gardens may, or guardians may strike you as odd, but they will keep showing up through the rest of the Scripture. Israel would have been instructed to have two cherubim guarding what is called the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. We see this in Exodus 25, verse 22, where in order to protect man from God's glory, it would kill man to see God in all this glory. God has graciously and kindly placed two cherubim there. Later, it would not only happen in the tabernacle, but later, cherubim would be placed by man in the temple. Images of cherubim would be woven into what was called the curtains of the tabernacle in the temple. This this massive curtain was about 60 foot tall and about four inches thick. You know, this is not a kind of curtain that you would have over a bathtub and a shower in your house. This was a massive thing that was intended to convey what is behind it 
is so holy and so righteous that you are not allowed to partake of it. You have lost your right to even see what is beyond the cherubim. They are guarding, in God's grace, His glory from you because it will kill you. This warned people that sinners and sin would not be allowed in the presence of God and that there's no way back to the presence of God unless God Himself removes the guarding cherubim. I want you to know all this and think all the way back. I want you to feel this even today, that that there was and there is internally a separation that you and I feel from God and His glory because of our sins. It's like there's a giant divide that separates us, like a giant canyon going down that separates us from God and His glory and us and our sins. But I want you to think forward through the Word as it unfolds at what God does to His people. At the garden, He keeps people from His presence with cherubim guarding the garden. At the tabernacle and in the temple, he has kept people from his holy presence with with cherubim woven into the veil, protecting and guarding the Ark of the Covenant. And yet, it is at the cross where darkness would encircle the land, where grounds would shake, where rocks would split, where a Savior dying on the cross would cry out with a loud voice, and it says he yielded up his spirit and finally dies. And the word immediately continues that at that very moment when he gave up his spirit and very much died, it says, behold, the curtain of the temple with cherubim woven within it would be torn in two from top to bottom. Access to God, feeling truly the tree of life, now not being placed in a garden, but in the holy presence of a Savior who continually draws people to himself, is given to a sinful people through the very action of Christ being killed so that the cherubim no longer needed to guard God's presence from them. Joy to the world. The Lord has come, we sing. Let, every, let earth receive her king. We say, let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. We, we sing and we talk about and we long for the glory of God as it came to us in the form of the seed of the woman who will crush the seed of the man to where we then sing, let no more sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, you have given to us a new song. You have given to us a new song that bears your Son's glory and his nature for our joy. Lord, we thank you for what your word says to us. We pray that you would give us hearts that long for obedience, long to pursue you through the effects of the fall, to long to be transformed into the likeness of your Son. But Lord, we thank you that even then, way back then, on the other side of the garden, you gave us hope and a glimpse of grace that you would achieve fully for us. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus, on the night before Jesus was crucified, he was eating dinner with his disciples. And as they were eating, he gave them a picture or what is called a sign of the gospel. What Jesus did, it's, it's called for us, we call it the Last Supper, was he took bread and wine and he divided the bread and passed it around and the wine passed it around as a meal and he said that they should eat of it and they should see it as a sign or as a memorial. But I want you to understand this through the lens of Genesis 3. In Genesis 3 at the beginning, what did Satan do but came up to the woman and he said, effectively, you don't have all that you need. Take this. And eat. I want you to understand it from that vantage point, but then what does Christ do do for us at that Lord's Supper? But he says, see this? This is my body. This is my blood. Take and eat. Friends, we believe that Christians should regularly observe the Lord's Supper because it points to the death and the fulfillment that we have because of Christ's death. At his death, he was 
killed for us. His blood was shed for us, assuring salvation for believers. And if you're here and you are repentant of your sin, if you are here and know that you are unworthy of God's grace and glory, but you believe in Jesus as your Savior and have repented of your sins, you need to recognize that what is being offered to you is for you in joy. Please do not come to these tables sad and pathetic like losers. Come to these tables recognizing that Jesus has given this and prepared this for you. If you're here and you're in, you're in a state of rebellion, you're in a state of sin, you are living a state of unconfessed sin, I want to encourage you not to partake. The, the word is clear in 1 Corinthians that you should not take this in an unworthy manner. If you are here under discipline from another church or from our church, I also want to encourage you to respond first in repentance of your sin and to not eat of this. For those of us who do come, I want you to think about this as looking back on what Christ has done. I want you, and I know this is awkward, I want you to look around also at who Christ has done this for. You're not alone as you come to the table. This is not a table for one. This is a table for God's people. And then also look forward to the time where Jesus will come and take this with us. Now, we've got tables all around the room, even up at the balcony. So when, the, when I, I will pray, and then when I finish praying, go up on your own. Don't need to be dismissed. And then come back, take those two things back to your seat. We'll take them all together. And if for whatever reason you don't want to or can't get up, but you would still like the elements, one of our deacons will come down the center aisle. If you just raise their hand, and they'll bring it to you in that way. But friends, let's approach the table with a posture of joy and thankfulness. Let's pray, and then you'll be dismissed to go and partake. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you of what you have spoken of, and we thank you for what you have done, and we thank you for what you promised to do. As we approach this sign, we pray that you would encourage our hearts to understand what your death means. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.